O'Flaherty VC comes wearily southward along the drive and falls exhausted into the garden seat. General Sir Pierce Madigan, an elderly baronet in khaki, beaming with enthusiasm, arrives. O'Flaherty rises and stands at attention. Oh, no, no, O'Flaherty, none of that now. You're off duty. Remember that though I am a general of 40 years service, that little cross of yours gives you a higher rank in the role of glory than I can pretend to. I am thankful to you, Sir Pierce, but I wouldn't have anyone think that the baronet of my native place would let a, a common soldier like me sit down in his presence without leave. Well, you're not a common soldier, O'Flaherty. You're a very uncommon one, and I'm proud to have you for my guest here today. Sure, I know, sir. You have to put up with a lot from the like of me, for the sake of the recruiting. Oh, the quality shakes hands with me and says they're proud to know me, just the way the king said when he pinned the cross on me. And it's as true as I'm standing here, sir. The queen said to me, I hear you were born on the estate of the General Madigan, she says. And the general himself tells me we're always a fine young fellow. Bedad, ma'am, I says to her, if the general knew all the rabbits I snared on him, and all the salmon I snatched on him, and all the cows I milked on him. He'd think me the finest ornament for that county jail he ever sent there for poaching. <laughs> well, you're welcome to them all, my lad. Come, sit down and enjoy your holiday. Holiday, is it? <laughs> I'd give five shillings to be back in the trenches for the sake of a little rest and quiet. I never knew what hard work was till I took to recruiting. What with the standing on my legs all day, and the shaking hands, and the making speeches, and what's worse, the listening to them, and the calling for cheers for king and country, and the saluting the fly till I'm stiff with it, and the listening to them playing God save the king in temporary, and the trying to make my eyes look moist like a man in a picture book. I'm a bet that I hardly get a wink of sleep. <sighs> I give you my word, Sir Pierce that I never heard the tune of Tipperary in my life till I came back from Flanders. And already it's drove me to that pitch of tiredness of it, that when a, a poor, little, innocent slip of a boy in the street the other night drew himself up and saluted and, and began whistling it at me, I clouted it in the head for him. God forgive me. Yes, yes, I know, I know. And one does get fed up with it. I've been dog-tired myself on parade many a time. But still, you know, there's a gratifying side to it, too. After all, he is our king, and it's our own country, isn't it? Well, sir, to you that have an estate in it, it would feel like your country. But the dibble of a perch of it ever I owned. And as to the king, God help him, my mother would have taken the skin off me back if I'd ever let on that I had any other king other than Parnell. Your mother? What are you dreaming about, O'Flaherty? A most loyal woman, always most loyal. Whenever there is an illness in the royal family, she asks me every time we meet about the health of the patient as anxiously as if it were yourself, her only son. Well, she's my mother, and I won't utter a word again her. But I'm not saying a word of a lie when I tell you that, that old woman is the biggest gnat from here to the cross of Monaster Boys. Well, sure, she's the wildest fenian and rebel, and always has been, that ever taught a poor, innocent lad like myself to pray night and morning to St. Patrick to clear the English out of Ireland, the same as he cleared the snakes. You'll be surprised am I telling you that now, maybe, Sir Pierce. Surprised? <laughs> I'm more than surprised, O'Flaherty. I'm overwhelmed. Are you... are you joking? If you've been brought up by my mother, sir, you'd know better than to joke about her. What I'm telling you is the truth, and I wouldn't tell it to you. If I could see my way to get out of the fix I'll be in when my mother comes here this day to see her boy in his glory, and she, after thinking all this time it was against the English I was fighting. But do you mean to say you told her such a monstrous falsehood that as, as that you were fighting in the German army? I never told her one word that wasn't the truth and nothing but the truth. I told her I was going to fight for the French and for the Russians. And sure, whoever heard of the French or the Russians doing anything to the English but fighting them? Well, that was how it was, sir. 
then sure the poor woman kissed me and went about the house singing in her old cracky voice that the French was on the sea. I be here without will decay, says the Sean Van Bott. Well, I never could have believed this. Never. What do you suppose will happen when she finds out? She mustn't find out. It's not that she'd half kill me. As big as I am and as brave as I am. It's that I'm fond of her and can't bring myself to break the heart in her. You may think it queer that a man should be fond of his mother, sir, and she'd be having bet him from the time he could feel to the time she was too slow to catch him. But I am fond of her, and I'm not ashamed of it. Besides, didn't she win the cross for me? Your mother? How? By bringing me up to be more afraid of running away than of fighting. Uh. I was timid by nature, and when the other boys hurted me, I'd want to run away and cry. But she railed me for disgracing the blood of the O'Flaherty's until I'd have fought the devil himself sooner than face her after funking a fight. That was how I got to know that fighting was easier than it looked, and that the others was as much feared of me as I was of them, and that if I only held it long enough, they'd lose heart and give rip. That's the way I came to be so courageous. I tell you, Sir Pierce, if the German army had been brought up by my mother, the Kaiser would be dining in the banqueted hall at Buckingham Palace this day, and King George polishing his jackboots for him in the scullery. I, I don't like this, O'Flaherty. You can't go on deceiving your mother, you know. It's not right. Can't go on deceiving her, can't I? It's little you know what a son's love can do, sir. Did you ever notice what a ready liar I am? Well, in recruiting, a man gets carried away. I stretch it a bit occasionally myself. After all, it's for King and country. But, if you won't mind my saying it, O'Flaherty, I think that story about your fighting the Kaiser and the Twelve Giants of the Prussian Guard single-handed would be the better for a little toning down. I don't ask you to drop it, you know, it's, it's, for, it's popular, undoubtedly, but still, the truth is the truth. Don't you think it would fetch in almost as many recruits if you reduced the number of guardsmen to six? You're not used to telling lies like I am, sir. I got to great practice at home with my mother. What with saving my skin when I was young and thoughtless, and sparring her feelings when I was old enough to understand them. I have hardly told my mother the truth twice a year since I was born. And would you have me turn around on her and tell it now, when she's looking to have some peace and quiet in her old age? Well, it's not my affair, of course, O'Flaherty. But hadn't you better talk to Father Quinlan about it? Talk to Father Quinlan, is it? Do you know what Father Quinlan says to me this very morning? Oh, you've seen him already, have you? Yeah, what did he say? He says, You know, don't you? He says, That it's your duty as a Christian and a good son of the Holy Church to love your enemies, he says. I know it's my duty as a, a soldier to kill them, I says. That's right, Denny, he says. Quite right. But, says he, you can kill them and do them a good turn afterwards to show them your love for them, he says. And it's your duty to have a mass said for the souls of the hundreds of Germans you say you killed, says he. For the many, and many of them were barbarians and good Catholics, he says. Is it me that must pay for the masses for the souls of the Bosches, I says. Let the King of England pay for them, I says, for it was his quarrel and not mine. Well, it is a quarrel of every honest man and a true patriot, O'Flaherty. Your mother must see that as clearly as I do. After all, she is a reasonable, well-disposed woman, quite capable of understanding the right and the wrong of the war. Why can't you explain to her what the war is about? Ah, oh, sir, how the devil do I know what the war is about? What? O'Flaherty, do you know what you are saying? You sit there wearing the Victoria Cross for having killed God knows how many Germans, and you tell me you don't know why you did it? Asking your pardon, Sir Pierce, I tell you no such thing. I know quite well why I killed them. Because I was afeard that, if I didn't, they'd kill me. Well, yes, yes, of course, but have you no knowledge of the causes of the war? Of the interest at stake? Of the importance? I may almost say, in fact, I will say, the sacred right for which we are fighting? Don't you read the papers? Do well, I do when I can get them. There's not many newsboys crying the evening paper in the trenches. They do say, Sir Pierce, that we shall never beat the Bosches until we make Horatio Bottomley Lord Lieutenant of England. 
Do you think that's true, sir? No, oh, rubbish, man. There's no Lord Lieutenant in England. The King is Lord Lieutenant. It's a simple question of patriotism. Does patriotism mean nothing to you? It means different to me than what it would to you, sir. It means England and England's king to you. To me and the like of me. It means talking about the English just the way the English papers talk about the Boches. And what good has patriotism ever done here in Ireland? It's kept me ignorant because it's filled up my mother's mind. And she thought it ought to fill up mine too. It's kept Ireland poor, because instead of trying to better ourselves, we thought we was the fine fellows of patriots when we were speaking evil of Englishmen that was as poor as ourselves, and maybe as good as ourselves. The Boches I killed was more knowledgeable men than me. And what better am I now that I've killed them? What better is anybody? I am sorry for the terrible experience of this war. The greatest war ever fought has taught you no better, O'Flaherty. I don't know about it being a great war, sir. It's a big war. But that's not the same thing. Father Quinlan's new church is a big church. You might take the little old chapel out of the middle of it and not miss it. But my mother says there was more true religion in the old chapel. And the war has taught me that maybe she was right. <laughs> oh. And there's another thing that has taught me too, sir, that concerns you and me. If I may make bold to tell it to you. I hope it's nothing you oughtn't to say to me, O'Flaherty. It's this, sir. That I'm able to sit here now and talk to you without humbugging you. And that's not what one of your tenants or your tenant's childer ever did to you before in all your life. It's a true respect I'm showing you at last, sir. Maybe you'd rather have me humbug you and tell you lies as I used, just as the boys here. God help them would rather have me tell them how I fought the Kaiser that all the world knows I never saw in my life than tell them the truth. But I can't take advantage of you the way I used, not even if I seem to be wanting in respect to you and cocked up by winning the cross. Not at all, Flaherty. Not at all. Sure. What's the cross to me, barring the little pension it carries? Do you think I don't know that there's hundreds of of men as brave as me that never had the luck to get anything for their bravery, but a curse from the sergeant, and the blame for the faults of them that ought to have been their betters. I've learnt more than you think, sir. For how would a gentleman like you know what a poor, ignorant, conceited creature I was when I went from here into the wide world as a soldier? What use is all the lying and pretending and humbugging and the letting on when the day comes to you that your comrade is killed in the trench beside you and you don't as much as look around at him until you trip over his poor body and then all you say is to ask why the hell the stretcher bearers don't take it out of the way why should i read the papers to be humbled and lied to by them that had the cunning to stay at home and sent me to fight for them don't talk to me or to any other soldier of the war being right no war is right and all the holy water that Father Quinlan has ever blessed could make one right. There, sir. Now you know what O'Flaherty V.C. thinks. And you're wiser so than the others that only knows what he done. Well, what you did was brave and manly anyhow. God knows whether it was or not. Better than you or me, General. I hope he won't be too hard on me for it anyhow. Oh, yes. We all have to think seriously sometimes, especially when we're a little run down. I'm afraid we've been overworking you a bit over these recruiting meetings. However, we can knock off for the rest of the day and tomorrow's Sunday. I've had about as much as I can stand myself. It's tea time. I wonder what's keeping your mother. It's nicely caught up. The old woman will be having tea at the same table as you, sir, instead of in the kitchen. Uh, she'll be after dressing in the height of grandeur. And stop she will at every house on the way to show herself off and tell them where she's going and fill the whole parish with spite and envy. But sure, she shouldn't keep you waiting, sir. Oh, that's all right. She must be indulged on an occasion like this. I'm sorry my wife is in London. Mm. She'd have been glad to welcome your mother. Sure, I know she would, sir. She was always a kind friend to the par. Little her ladyship knew, God help her, 
the depth of devilment that was in us. We were like a play to her. Now, you see, sir, she was English. And that was how it was. Oh, her ladyship never knew all that was going on behind her back. How would she? When I was a wee she child, she gave me my first penny I ever had in my hand. And I wanted to pray for her conversion that night, the same as me mother made me pray for yours. What, do you mean to say that your mother made you pray for my conversion? Sure. And she wouldn't want me to see a gentleman like you go on to hell after she nursing your own son and bringing up my sister Annie on the bottle. Well, that was how it was, sir. She'd rob you. She'd lie to you. She'd call you down all the blessings of God on your head when she was selling you your own three geese that you thought had been ate by a fox the day after you finished fattening them, sir. And all the time you were like a bit of her own flesh and blood to her. Often has she said she lived to see you a good Catholic yet, leading victorious armies across against the English and wearing the collar of gold that Malachi won from the proud invader. Oh, she... She's the romantic woman, is my mother, and make no mistake. I, I really can't believe this, O'Flaherty. I could have sworn your mother was as honest a woman as ever breathed. And so she is, sir. She's as honest as the day. Do you call it honest to steal my geese? She didn't steal them, sir. It was me that stole them. Oh, and why the devil did you steal them? Well, sure, we needed them, sir. Often and often we had to sell our own geese to pay you the rent to satisfy your needs. And why shouldn't we sell our geese to satisfy ours? Well, damn me. Sure. You had to get what you could out of us. And we had to get what we could out of you. God forgive us both. Ah, oh, really, O'Flaherty, the war seems to have upset you a little. It set me thinking, sir, and I'm not used to it. It's like the patriotism of the English. Well, they never thought of being patriotic until the war broke out. And now that... The patriotism has touched them so sudden and come so strange to them that they run about like frightened chickens, uttering all manner of nonsense. But please, God, they'll forget all about it when the war is over. They're getting tired of it already. No, no. It has uplifted us in a wonderful way. The world will never be the same again, O'Flaherty. Not after a war like this. So they say, sir. I see no great difference myself. It's all the fright and the excitement. And when that quiets down, they'll go back to their natural devilment and be the same as ever. It's like the vermin. It'll wash off after a while. Well, the long and the short of it is O'Flaherty. I must decline to be a party to any attempt to deceive your mother. I thoroughly disapprove of this feeling against the English, especially at a moment like the present. Even if your mother's political sympathies are really what you represent them to be, I should think that her gratitude to Gladstone ought to cure her of such disloyal prejudices. Well, she says Gladstone was an Irishman, sir. What call would he have to meddle with Ireland as he did if he wasn't? What nonsense. Does she suppose Mr. Asquith was, is an Irishman? She won't give him any credit for home rule, sir. She says Redmond made him do it. She says you told her so. Well, I never meant her to take it up in that ridiculous way. I'll give her a good talking to when she comes. I'm not going to stand any of her nonsense. It's not a bit of use, sir. She says all the English generals is Irish. She says all the English poets and great men was Irish. She says the English never knew how to read their own books until we taught them. She says we're the lost tribes of the house of Israel and the chosen people of God. She says that the goddess Venus that was born out of the foam of the sea came up out of the water in Killiney Bay off Brayhead. She says that Moses built the seven churches and that Lazarus was built in Glasnevin. Bosh! How does she know he was? Did, did he ever ask her? No, I did, sir. Often. And what did he, she say? She asked me how I did know he wasn't, and fetched me a clout on the side of the head. But have you never mentioned any famous Englishman to her, and asked her what she had to say about him? Well, the only one I could think of was Shakespeare, sir. And she says he was born in Cork. <sighs> well, I give up. The woman is... Oh, well, uh, no matter. Yes, sir. She's pig-headed and obstinate. There's no doubt about it. But she's like the English. They think there's no one like themselves. It's the same with the Germans, though they're educated and ought to know better. 
You'll never have a quiet world till you knock the patriotism out of the human race. Well, still we... Wishes, sir. For God's sake, here she is. Good evening, mother. You hold your wish and learn behavior while I pay my duty to his honor. And how is your honor's good self? And how is her ladyship and all the young ladies? Oh, it's right glad we are to see your honor back again and look in the picture of health. Oh, thank you, Miss Zoflarity. Uh, well, you see, we brought you back your son safe and sound. I hope you're proud of him. And indeed I am, your honor. It's the brave boy he is. And why wouldn't he be brought up on your honor's estate and with you before his eyes for a pattern of the finest soldier in Ireland? <laughs> Come and kiss your old mother, Dinny, darling. <laughs> That's my own darling boy. <laughs> and look at your fine new uniform, stained already with the eggs you've been eating and the porter you've been drinking. <laughs> oh, it's the untidy, slovenly one you always were. There, it won't be seen on the khaki. It's not like the old red coat that would show up everything that dribbled down on it. And they tell me down at the lodge that her ladyship is staying in London and that Miss Agnes is to be married to a fine young nobleman. <laughs> oh, it's your honour that is the lucky and happy father. It will be bad news for many of the young gentlemen of the quality round here, sir. There's lots thought she was going to marry young Master Lawless. What? That, 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 that bastoon! <laughs> Your Honour, I long for finding the right word. <laughs> a big bastoon he is indeed, Your Honour. Oh, to think of the times and times I have said that Miss Agnes would be my lady, as her mother was before her. Didn't I, didn't he? And now, Mrs. O'Flaherty, I dare say you have a great deal to say to Dennis that doesn't concern me. I'll just go in and order tea. Oh, why would Your Honour disturb yourself? Sure, I can take the boy into the yard. Not at all. It won't disturb me in the least. And he's too big a boy to be taken into the yard now. Uh, he has made a front seat for himself, eh? Sure he has that, Your Honour. God bless Your Honour. And what do you mean, you lying young scald, for telling me you were going to fight again the English? Do you take me for a fool that couldn't find out and the paper's all full of you shaking hands with the English king at Buckingham Palace? I didn't shake hands with him, he shook hands with me. Could I turn on the man in his own house, before his own wife, with his money in my pocket and in yours, and throw his civility back in his face? You would take the hand of a tyrant red with the blood of that Ireland. Don't hold her nonsense, mother. He's not half the tyrant you are, God help him. His hand was cleaner than mine, that had the blood of his own relations on it, maybe. Is that a way to speak to your mother, your young spalpeen? It is so, if you won't talk sense to me. It's a nice thing for a poor boy to be made much by the kings and queens and shook hands with by the height of his country's nobility in the capital cities of the world. And then to come home to be scolded and insulted by his own mother. I'll fight for who I like. I'll shake hands with what kings I like. And if your own son is not good enough for you, you can go and look for another. Do you mind me now? And was it the Belgians learned you such brazen impudence? The Belgians is good men, and the French ought to be more civil to them, let alone their being half murdered by the Bosches. Good men, is it? Good men to come over here when they were wounded because it was a Catholic country, and then to go to the Protestant church because it didn't cost them anything, and some of them to never go near a church at all. That's what you call good men. Oh, you're the mighty fine politician, aren't you? What you know about Belgians or foreign parts of the world you're living in, God help you. Why wouldn't I know better than you, Emma I your mother? And if you are itself, how can you know what you have never seen, as well as me, that was dug into the continent of Europe for six months and was buried in the earth of it three times with the shells bursting on top of me? I tell you, I know what I'm about. I have my own reasons for taking part in this great conflict. I'd be ashamed to stay at home and not fight when everybody else is fighting. If you wanted to fight, why couldn't you fight in the German army? Because they only get a penny a day. 
Well, and if they do itself, isn't there a French army? You only get a halfpenny a day. Oh, murder. They must be a mean lot, Dinny. Well, maybe you'd have me in the Turkish army and worship the heathen Muhammad and put a corn in his ear and pretended it was a message from the heavens when the pigeon come to pick it out and eat it. I went where I could to get the biggest allowance for you. Then the little thanks I get for it. Allowance, is it? <laughs> Do you know what the thieving blackguards did on me? They came to me and they says, Was your son a big eater? They says, Oh, he was that, says I. Ten shillings a week wouldn't keep him. Sure, I thought, the more I said, the more they'd give me. <laughs> then, says they, that's ten shillings a week off your allowance, they says, because you saved that by the king feeding him. Indeed, says I. I suppose if I'd six sons, you'd stop three pound a week from me and make out that I ought to pay you money instead of you paying me. There's a fallacy in your arguments, they says. A what? A fallacy. That's the word he said. I says to him, it's a fallacy. I'm thinking you mean, sir, but you can keep your dirty money that your king grudges a poor old widow. And please, God, the English will be got yet for the deadly sin of oppressing the poor. And with that, I shut the door in his face. Do you mean to tell me they knocked ten shillings off you for my keep? No, darling, they only knocked off half a crown. I put up with it because I've got the old age pension, and they know very well I'm only 62, so I have the better of them by half a crown a week anyhow. It's a queer way of doing business. If they tell you straight out what they was going to give you, you wouldn't mind. But if there was 20 ways of telling the truth and only one way of telling a lie, the government would find it out. It's in the nature of the governments to tell lies. You're to come up to the drawing room to have your tea, Mr. Flaherty. Mind you have a sup of good black tea for me in the kitchen afterwards, Akushla. That washy drawing room tea will give me the wind if I leave it on my stomach. <laughs> Is that yourself, Tessie? And how are you? Nicely, thank you. And how's yourself? Finally, thank God. Look at this gold chain I brought you, Tessie. Sure, I don't like to touch it, Denny. Did you take it off a dead man? No, I took it off a live one. And thankful he was to me to be alive and kept a prisoner in ease and comfort. And me left fighting in the peril of my life. Do you think it's real gold, Denny? It's real German gold, anyhow. But German silver isn't real, Denny. Well, it's the best the Bosch could do for me, anyhow. Do you think I might take it to the jeweller next market day and ask him? You may take it to the devil if you like. Lose your temper about it. I only thought I'd like to know. A nice fool I'd look if I went about showing off a chain that turned out to be only brass. I think you might say thank you. Do you? I think you might have said something more to me than is that yourself? You couldn't say less to the postman. Oh, is that what's the matter? Well, here. Come and take the taste of the brass out of my mouth. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God the priest can't see us here. It's little they care for priests in France, Helena. And what had the queen on her, Denny, when she spoke to you in the palace? She had a bonnet on without any strings to it. And she had a plan keen of embroidery down her bosom. And she had her waist where it used to be, and not where the other ladies had it. And she had little brooches in her ears, though she hadn't had half the jewellery of Mrs. Sullivan that keeps the pop shop in Drumpog. <laughs> <laughs> and she dresses her hair down over her forehead like in a fringe like. And she has an Irish look about her eyebrows. And she didn't know what to say to me, poor woman. And I didn't know what to say to her. God help me. You'll have a pension now with the cross, won't you, Denny? Six pence, three farthings a day. That isn't much. <sighs> Might take out the rest in glory. <laughs> and if you're wounded, you'll have a wound pension, won't you? I will, please God. <laughs> you're going out again, aren't you, Denny? 
Well, I can't help myself. I'd be shot for a deserter if I didn't go. And maybe I'll be shot by the bosses if I do go. So between the two of them, I'm nicely fixed up. Tessie! Tessie, darling! I'm wanted for the tea table. You'll have a pension anyhow, Denny, won't you? Whether you're wounded or not. Come, child, come. Oh, sure, I'm coming. And if I do get a pension itself, the divil a penny bit you'll ever have a spending of. Oh, it's a shame for you to keep the girl from her duties, Dinny. You might get her into trouble. Much I care whether she gets into trouble or not. I pity the man that gets her into trouble. He'll get himself into worse. What's that you tell me? Have you been falling out of her? And she a girl with a fortune of ten pounds. Let her keep her fortune. I wouldn't touch her with the tongs if she had thousands and millions. Oh, fie for shame, Dinny. Why would you say the like of that, of a decent, honest girl? And one of the Driscolls, too. Why wouldn't I say it? She's thinking of nothing but to get me out there again, to be wounded, so that she may spend my pension bad scran to her. Why, what's come over your child at all, at all? Knowledge and wisdom has come over me, with pain and fear and trouble. I've been made a fool of and imposed upon all my life. I thought the covetous streel in there was a walking angel. And now, if I ever marry a tall, I'll marry a French one. You're not so. And don't you dare repeat such a thing to me. Won't I, Faith? I've been as good as married to a couple of them already. The oh, Lord be praised. What wickedness have you been up to, you young blackguard? Well, one of them French women would cook you a meal twice in a day and all the days and every day that Sir Pierce himself might go begging through Ireland for and never see the like of. I'll have a French wife, I tell you. And when I settle down to be a farmer, I'll have a French farm with a field as big as the continent of Europe that ten of your dirty little fields here wouldn't so much as fill that ditch of. Then it's a French mother you may go look for. I'm done with you. And it's no great loss you'd be if it wasn't for my natural feelings for you. For it's only a silly, ignorant, all countryman you are with all your fine talk about Ireland. You, that never stepped beyond the few acres of it you were born on. Jenny, darling, why are you like this to me? What's happened to you? What's happened to everybody? That's what I want to know. What's happened to you that I thought all the world of and was afeard of? What's happened to Sir Pierce that I thought was a great general, that I now see to be no more fit to command an army than an all hen? What's happened to Tessie that I was mad to marry a year ago? that I now wouldn't take with all the Ireland for her fortune. I tell you, the world's creation is crumbling in ruins about me. And then you come and ask me what's happened to me. Oh, oh, oh. My son's turned again me. Oh, what do I do at all? Oh, oh. What's this infernal noise? What on earth is the matter? Ara, hold your wish, mother. Don't you see his honour? Oh, sir, I'm ruined and destroyed. Oh, won't you speak to Dinny, sir? I'm hard scalded with him. He wants to marry a French woman on me, and to go away and be a foreigner, and desert his mother, and betray his country. It's mad he is with the roaring of the cannons, and he killing the Germans, and the Germans killing him bad cess to them. My boy is taken from me, and turned again me. And who's to take care of me in the old age after all I've done for him? Oh, Hold your noise, I tell you. Who's going to leave you? I'm going to take you with me. There now, does that satisfy you? Is it take me into a strange land among heathens and pagans and savages, and me not knowing a word of their language, nor them of mine? A good job they don't. Maybe they'll think they're talking sense. Ask me to die out of Ireland, is it? And the angels not to find me when they come for me. And would you ask me to live in Ireland, where I've been imposed on and kept in ignorance, and to die where the devil himself wouldn't take me as a gift, let alone the blessed angels? 
You can come or stay. You can take your old way or take me young way. But stick in this place I will not among a lot of good-for-nothing devils that will not do a hand's turn but watch the grass grow and build up the stone wall where the cow walked through it. And Sir Horace Plunkett, breaking his heart all the time, telling them how they might put the land into decent tillage like the French and Belgians. Yes, he's quite right, you know, Mrs. O'Flaherty. Uh, quite right there. Well, sir, please God the war will last a long time yet. And maybe I'll die before it's over when the separation allowance stops. That's all you care about. It's nothing but milk cows we men are for your women with their separation allowances ever since the war began. Bad luck to them that made it. Hannah sent up for me to tell you, sir, that the tea will be black and the cake not fit to eat with the cold if you all don't come at once. Oh, Tessie, darling, what have you been saying to Dinny at all, at all? Oh. You can't discuss that here. We shall have Tessie beginning now. That's right, sir. Drive them in. I even said a word to him. Hold your tongue and go in and attend to your business at the tea table. But am not I telling your honour that I never said a word to him? He gave me a beautiful gold chain. Here it is to show your honour that it's no lie I'm telling you. What's this, O'Flaherty? You've been looting some unfortunate officer. No, sir. I stole it from him of his own accord. Wouldn't your honour tell him? His mother has the first call on it. What would a slip of a girl like that be doing with a gold chain round her neck? Anyhow, I have a neck to put it round, and not a hank of wrinkles. You impudent young heifer, how dare you say such a thing to me? I've a good mind to clout your ears for you to teach you matters. Is it me off for such a name too, you Foul-mouthed, dirty-minded, lion, slew their old sow, you! Silence! Tessie, did you hear me ordering you to go into the house? Be ashamed of yourself, do, and learn to know who you're speaking to. Oh, that I may sin, but I don't know what the good God was thinking about when he made the like of you. Mrs. O'Flaherty, Mrs. O'Flaherty. I wouldn't soil my tongue by calling you in your right name and telling Sir Pierce what's the common talk of the town about you. Will you just listen to me for one moment, please? Do you hear me speaking to you, woman? Let me not see you casting sheep's eyes at my son again. There never was an O'Flaherty yet that would demean himself by keeping company with a dirty Driscoll. And if I see you next or nigh my house, I'll put you in the ditch with a flea in your ear. Mind that now. You and your O'Flaherty's setting yourself up again the Driscolls that would never lower themselves to be seen in conversation with you at the fair. Are you human beings or are you wild beasts? Stop that noise immediately. Do you hear? You can keep your ugly, stingy lump of a son for what is he but a common soldier. And God help the girl that gets him, say I. So the back of my hand to you, Miss O'Flaherty, and that the cat may scratch your ugly old face. Are you going to do what I order you, or are you not? It's scandalous. It's disgraceful. This comes from being too familiar with you. O'Flaherty, shove them into the house. Out with the whole damn pack of you. Here now, none of that. None of that. Go easy, I tell you. Hold your wished, mother, will you? Or you'll be sorry for it after. Is that the way for a decent young girl to speak? Let me have no more of it, I tell you. Ugh! The, the devil's in the whole crew of you! In with you into the house this very minute and tear one another's eyes out in the kitchen, if you like. In with you! What a discontented sort of an animal a man is, sir. Only a month ago, I was in the quiet of the country, out at the front, with not a sound except the birds and the bellow of a cow in the distance as it might be. 
and the shrapnel making little clouds in the heavens and the shells whistling and maybe a yell or two when one of us was hit. And would you believe it, sir? I complained of the noise and wanted to have a peaceful hour at home. Well, them two has taught me a lesson. This morning, sir, when I was telling the boys here how I was longing to be back, taking my part for king and country with the others, I was lying, as you well knew, sir. Now I can go and see it with a clear conscience. Some likes war alarms, some likes home life. I've tried both, sir. And I'm for war's alarms now. I always was a quiet lad, my natural disposition. Uh, strictly between ourselves, O'Flaherty, and as one soldier to another, do you think we should have got an army without conscription if domestic life had been as happy as people say it is? Well, between you and me and the wall, Sir Pierce, I think the less we say about that until the war is over, the better. And now I'd like to introduce the cast to you. John Cormier as Private O'Flaherty. Terry Barna as General Sir Madigan Pierce. Melissa Good as Teresa and myself, Kathleen Sheehy, as Mrs. O'Flaherty. Thank you for watching, and we look forward to the day when we can all be together in the theater again. Until then, stay well.